Mine is not a plight for all womankind, but a personal plight, in support of only my own rights, not as a woman, but as a human being. As was instilled by my father when I was young of age, I have a duty to myself above all others and to the cultivation of my own improvement. My education at his hands was that of a boy's. I read the classics and Latin, privileges usually forbidden to my sex. For men prefer that women be kept ignorant. My mother remained largely absent. I never durst open my heart to her. By the time of my father's death, when I was twelve, his ideals had been thoroughly instilled in me, and my hopes for marriage were but naive hopes of finding another whom loved me as he did. I should have known better than to place any stock in a mere dream. At just fourteen, my keen intellect was identified, and I was invited to join the Blue Stockings, a club for women to discuss the arts, literature, music and drama, away from the disapproving eyes of men. We would take it in turns to play hostess at dinner parties, whilst sharing our passions and celebrating cultural accomplishments of women past and present. It was a relief and joy to be surrounded by others who were eager to announce their opinions, without fear of being scolded or worse, laughed at. At Blue Stockings, we often found ourselves victims of mockery from men, who poked fun at our ambitions and our interests. I quickly learned that an intelligent female is often considered nothing but eccentric. My exposure to the written word was unrestricted. I often encountered writings of a pornographic nature, Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure and Ranger's Magazine taught me quickly that carnal encounters between men and women were not entirely exclusive to the wedding bed. My innocent and accomplished flirtations fueled gossip. Gossip that I rather encouraged, I admit, in hope that time and reason would show the rumours to be false. My flirtatious nature was rooted in girlishness, mischievousness and vanity, never in lust. I was never a sickly child and remain in my adult years a pillar of strength but have been increasingly prone to violent hysterical fits which have only worsened with each child I have birthed. Both in health and in looks I would become exceedingly weakened. I would feel an intense accumulation of tension and could, on occasions, intercept such attacks with a strong chamomile tea, or by plunging my hands into ice-cold water. I'm sure my malady would be considered neither divine nor sinister, if only it were understood. I cannot confess to being a natural mother, perhaps due to my innate fear that having children makes a man like his wife less. The very thought of being alone with my first husband, the Earl of Strathmore, made me physically sick. I was tempted by my partiality to Scotsman and took George Grey as a lover. Throughout my indiscretions with George Grey, I aborted three pregnancies. On the first occasion, I ordered Grey to fetch me a quack medicine he had happened upon through hearsay which he duly obtained. It was a black, inky kind of medicine with a strong taste of copper. 
the solution worked. I used it again on a second occasion. On the next pregnancy, the black ink failed me, and in desperation to commit this crime for a third time, I swiftly drank an emetic with a large glass of brandy and a vast amount of pepper, which caused me to vomit violently and successfully induced another miscarriage. My crime was not for wishing to take control of my body, but rather my foolishness in repeatedly allowing my late night conversations with Grey to dissolve into lust. Soon after the death of Strathmore, I was pregnant for the fourth and final time by my lover. I tried once more the quack solution, I tried the emetic, the brandy and the pepper, but this child would not die. I conceded out of desperation to allow Grey to take me in marriage. The marriage never came to be, for I swiftly became involved with my second husband, Andrew Robinson Stoney and he took the bastard child as his own.